This has been 20 centuries in the making. Here it is, in the year of our Lord, sorry, reflections on 20 centuries of church history. Uh, but this, this title did not begin as a book originally, did it? No. Would you tell us the story of the origin? <laughs> I was hoping you would ask that question. Um, this, this book actually began in 1999. Um, in, the, in the church I served, uh, it was in the run-up to the turn of the millennium, as most people thought of it. Um, and in the last 20 weeks of 1999, I, I thought I should uh, give a series of little short talks uh, early on in our Sunday evening worship on the story of the church, because I, f I felt that probably most of our members did not know much about the story of the church before they actually became church members. And so, what we did was, early on in the service, I, I would give a talk of about seven to ten, maybe to twelve minutes um, on each of the centuries, and then we would sing a hymn from that century and just go on with the rest of the service. Um, and um, I think perhaps because it was true that people didn't know a great deal about the story of the church, that they were interested enough to want me to publish. And it's one thing to sit down for a few minutes and think of something interesting from 100 years, but it's, it's a wee bit different actually to put that into print and make it more permanent. And it just kind of lay at the back of my mind. And uh, then sometime, I don't know, maybe five years ago, uh, I, I had the opportunity or the time to think about maybe writing it up, and so it ended up as in the year of our Lord. Well, one of the things that's interesting is just the way you've structured this book, which I think is, is so helpful. Um, e each chapter, as you said, is looking at a century, but you've broken it up where you have a primary text or a primary source from someone significant in that period. Then you have your reflections on that individual, other people from that century. And then you, you said in church you, you would sing a hymn. You have the, the lyrics, the words to those, to those hymn, hymns. And I just think it's such a a helpful tool, even for devotional reading. It doesn't take a large commitment. If you dedicated, if you dedicated reading a chapter a day, 20, 20 days, you'd be through it, or a chapter a week. But the way you've structured it, I found really just helpful. Well, originally, I, I didn't really have those quotations or, you know, something from the century. But when we were doing the book, I thought that would be really interesting to people to get an original flavor of what things were like in these different centuries. Um, because it's really important, I think, as you look over the history of the church, to realize that all of our heroes were sinful men and women. They didn't all understand the gospel perfectly, and some of the greatest of them had real flaws. Um, and when we discover that our heroes have flaws, it does help us, I think, to look at church history with a gentler eye. Um, I remember a very wise man saying to me one day, you know, when you, when you think about a theologian, you need to ask the question, was he going down the hill or was he going up the hill? And I think many of the people who appear in this book were going up the hill, but none of them had reached the top of the hill. Um, and it, it really… You know, one of the things I try to say in the book is that it's very easy to develop a, what I call a boo-hurrah theory of the history of the church. So, you've got these names, and you shout hurrah, and you've these other names, and, and you shout boo. But when you really know about some of the great figures, there are some things about them that you also need to say boo to. Um, and perhaps the most famous of those is, is uh, St. Uh, Augustine who had marvelous strengths and really bequeathed to the church some very significant frailties, so much so that B.B. B. Warfield once wrote that the Reformation was about Augustine against Augustine. And 
I think when we do that, we become much… when we see that, we become much less arrogant in the way in which we think about characters in the history of the church. And for that reason, church history is a very helpful study for us. Well, I liked one of the lines you said touching on that. You said, we can have hearts that have been washed cleaner than our heads. Yes. And that's, you know, that's true of all of us. You know, you have been washed, you have been uh, sanctified, says Paul. Um, but that doesn't mean that you think with perfect clarity. And, you know, a huge element in th the study of theology that shapes the church is that we, we think with increasingly uh, great clarity about what Scripture teaches us. And, you know, we, we, we all know this, but we all come to the reading of Scripture with all the junk that has been put into our lives and some of that junk has actually been put into our lives by the churches that we've attended. So, for example, um, someone was speaking to me today about, uh, about having friends who are not Calvinists. And one of the things I was saying was, you, you need to understand that, uh, that, that people's emotions are shaped by some of the prejudicial things that have been said in the churches to which they belonged. So, you're not just dealing with the issue of, there's the truth, do you understand it? You're dealing with the fact that, that we, we come to the truth with all kinds of prejudices, some of them that have been put into us by people who have not taught the gospel well, some of us because of our own resistance to the, the truth of the church. So, there is, more to th there is more to clear thinking than just the use of the brain. And uh, I think as you go through uh, the story of the church, you, you come to realize that more and more. Well, how about we jump into some of the content here? So, you do have 20 chapters going through the 20 centuries. Um, I, I will just say this, that the inclusion of those primary source materials, just an excerpt from someone's writings from that period, um, we, we, we know that people have a lack of understanding of church history, generally speaking. And I think what you've done in this book has provided a really easy way for people to get a taste of consuming primary sources, which is foreign to so many Christians. So, I, I was really, really encouraged um, reading through this, particularly because of that. I know a number of people that have benefited from it. But let's jump to the second century. We can't do all 20. If you want all 20, you need to buy the book. Of course, it's available in the bookstore, but you know, know that already. Um, in the, the second century, you, you talk about the persecution that the church faced at that time, and when we look at our situation, we're not facing persecution like they were. We're not being torn up by animals. We're not being set ablaze. Um, and I think if we're honest, we'd probably say we, we fear the thought of something like that happening to us in this day and age. But you note something interesting as you reflect on the second century, that what we should fear is not persecution in the church or coming to the church, but, but false teaching. Yes. Um, w one of the dominant themes, I think, in the early Christians, I, I think I maybe even put it like this in the book, that martyrdom will never kill you ultimately, but false teaching always will. Martyrdom will never destroy the church, but false teaching will always destroy the church. And interestingly, you know, w they believed that, but we are living in a time when that is is much clearer to us in terms of our experience of the world than it, it could have been to them, because we recognize that many of the parts of the world where the Christian church has flourished in the last hundred years have been those parts of the world that have suffered greatest persecution, and the places where the church has almost fallen into the sea are the places where the church has experienced false teaching. It's a, it's a, it is as clear as crystal in the history of the last hundred years. I'm going to jump ahead another couple of centuries. This is kind of like Doctor Who and doing some time travel here, but if we go to the fourth century, and I think your reflections here are particularly relevant because of kind of the celebrity culture we live in today where you have uh, celebrity pastors and all these kinds of things. You, quoting you, you say, faithfulness is far more significant than fame when Jesus is building His church. And you talk about significant figures of the fourth century, and just note that 
the people that the Lord used to bring them to faith, we don't know their names. Yeah. Um, and, and God has this habit of just plucking the ordinary people out and using them for His glory. Yeah, I love, I love to um, just run off a few names that I think everybody in the congregation will know and then ask the question, do you know through whom they were converted? And in most cases, blank expressions will appear. Um, and part, you know, part of, I think, the importance of beginning to see this is that, that all the way through the history of the Christian church, there is, al there is always this tendency uh, for particular figures to arise that we look on as though they operated completely individually. And in my reading of church history, this is true virtually without exception, that around any individual who has uh, been used by God to do something uh, unusual or particular, if you scrape a little, you will always find that there was an entire brotherhood or sisterhood around them. And you can go through, uh, you can go through, I think, virtually all of the centuries and see every new work of God emerges from a community, from a brotherhood, and not just from an isolated individual. And there are so many illustrations of that. When uh, we've been talking about this book in the past and, and reading through your introduction, you had noted about this survey that was done at the turn of the century, uh, which I think illustrates um, not just our lack of knowledge of certain key figures, but um, the fact that most of our knowledge in history, you know, only goes back yes. a number of decades. Yes. Do, do you mind sharing that with us? Yeah, well, I had introduced this series by saying I, I had a concern that we get to know the whole story of the church um, because I thought that we lived in a world that had almost no sense of history. And, you know, the adage that, that, you know, many people have said, if we don't know anything about history, we will almost certainly repeat its mistakes. And about, you know, maybe a few weeks into this series, one of the major newspapers in the United Kingdom published the result of a poll in which the question was, who has been the most significant figure in the last millennium, male and female? And the results, this was the results of the, the great British public's voting, was the single most significant figure, male, in the last thousand years was Nelson Mandela, and the single most significant female in the last thousand years was Princess Diana, which, you know, whatever you think about either of those individuals told you that most people today are living in a kind of soap opera world. They know nothing beyond what the media tells them, um, and they know nothing before their own lifetime. And my, my thesis really, I don't know that I really spelled this out, but my thesis was really, often as it is in the world, so it is in the church. And therefore, one of the gravest dangers for the church is that we think the church began essentially a few years before we became members of the church. And that therefore, and I think you can see this in so many different ways, therefore we are the first ones to, quote, invent how to, quote, do church. And when we do that, we, we keep repeating the mistakes of the past because we don't know that others did exactly what we did in their culture, and it failed in their culture, and it will fail in our culture as well, and it will be yet another passing phase. And once we get caught up in these things, we'll never build uh, stable churches, and, and actually we'll never have a… we'll always have a moving Christian life, and we need to go down not only uh, theologically down, but it's really helpful for us to go historically down so that we've got solid roots in the big family to which we belong. Well, touching on the tactics of, of how to do church, you had a, I guess, a rather scathing assessment of the modern church when you were reflecting back did on I the really? sixth century. Yes, you did, surprisingly. I wrote that chapter when I got up on the wrong side of the bed <laughs> in that case. You hadn't had your tea yet. Yeah, um, yeah. But you tell the story of Ninian and you reflect on 
uh, the work there in communities, and you yes. reflected on the modern church where the modern church wants to, to plant their buildings close to an interstate so people can just easily get to church, easily lead, uh, leave, and, and then come back again the following week, and they're not actually involved in their communities. Who, who was Ninian? Because yeah. I'm sure everyone here knows who um, Ninian was, but just in case they don't. Probably we're familiar with names like Patrick, and maybe some of you are familiar with the name of uh, Columba. And Ninian belongs to that category of monk. Now, we, I think we Protestants tend to think a monk is a monk is a monk. And essentially what a monk does is withdraw from the world. And many monks did withdraw from the world. But there were other monks that we might say were evangelistic monks. Uh, they were missionary monks. And so their monastic community was not withdrawn from the world, but was embedded in the world. And so they built their monasteries in places where people were, not where people were not, in order that they might communicate the gospel. And uh, Patrick, Ninian, Columba all belonged to, to that order of monks. They were, they were missionary monks. And I think the, the reflection uh, was that, and this is true especially in the United States, partly because the road system is so good, that when people want to build larger, they tend to look for a site as near as possible to the crossroads of major intersections so that people can come to that church from a considerable distance without thinking that therefore by definition that church is not buried into the community in which it's actually placed. People do not intersect with one another. And the, I can't remember whether I say this in the book, but it is such a hobby horse that I should have said it in the book. It means nobody expects them to come back later in the day for another service. And I personally regard the loss of the evening service as one of the single greatest disasters of the Western church. Um, and and my, my, experience, my experience is that people don't realize it and ask, why should that be? Because they've never actually experienced it. Um, and part of the reason for that is because we've had the unwisdom to think of building bigger and in a geographically strategic area for people to come from a fairly considerable distance without first of all asking the question, what is the church really for? And so in a way, we've gone the wrong way around about asking about the question. Well, let's jump to the Middle Ages, 10th century. We're halfway there. We're going to have to skip a few centuries to get this Good. done in time. But you say this, that the decay of the church is never the fault of the world. Inward spiritual decline always precedes outward collapse. What did you mean by that? Well, I meant by that that the, the, the church never dictates what the world… The, ch the, the world never dictates what the church should be. That I think what is crystal clear in the New Testament is the gospel works anywhere and everywhere. And there are many Christians who have a tendency to think that the gospel works best when the world treats us most gently. And again, we're, we are living in the very century in which it has become abundantly clear that actually the reverse is the truth, and we should learn something from that. We should learn how important it is that a church seems to be really different from the world. And we have… I don't know if we are out of the season yet when there's just been very strong emphasis that if we're going to reach the world, we've got in these various ways to become like the world so that they see we're not really all that different from them. But to me, almost a litmus test is what happens in the church in Acts chapter 5, where we're told that such, such a sense of awe, such a sense of God's holiness came upon the church that nobody dared join them. But almost in the next breath, Luke is saying, people began to pile into the church. And that's what we've seen in many of the parts of the world where the church has been persecuted. You know, I, the thought of joining them when they're persecuted, 
and yet people piling into the church. Why is that happening? Because they see the gospel lived out in the community so differently that they're drawn to it and drawn to Christ through it. So, we mustn't replay the mistakes of the past. Still thinking about just the tactics of the church and how we seem to be so eager to, to find, you know, the next thing that's going to bring a revival or church growth. I loved your quote from uh, Knox when he said, God gave His Holy Spirit to simple men in great abundance, kind of like Luther who said the word did it all. Yeah, that was a great emphasis of the Reformation, that the, the Word itself does the work when it's preached and taught in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word and the Spirit always together. And, you know, one of the reasons for emphasizing that is I think I've lived through an era of church history where the dominant note has been the Word tells you what to do, and then you've got to go away and do it. And there's been very little emphasis on the fact that God uses His Word to do it in you. And that is particularly true of preaching, that God changes your life, not by you listening to a sermon and then going out and thinking, what am I supposed to do? But He changes your life by the preaching of the Word itself. It molds you, it shapes you, it sanctifies you. And that's why it's so important that we, uh, we long for and pray for the preaching of the Word in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the Spirit without the Word or the Word without the Spirit, but this God-given combination of Word and Spirit. When we, particularly as Reformed Christians, look back to the Reformation, we, we look back to it with fondness, and sometimes when we perhaps reflect on the 20th century, Christians are prone to be discouraged by what they see, but you actually state that we should be encouraged when we look at the church in the 20th century. Yeah, if we look at the world church, there have been more martyrs in the last hundred years than, than possibly the whole of church history put together. There has been more growth. There are more Christians in the world than, than ever before. We here live on a very large island, but we can be very insular, you know. Um, and, and I think one of the blessings I find in reading church history is a little like as many of you have experienced, going, some, going to some other country for a period, and you realize you can never look at your own country with the same eyes again. And we need to learn to look at the church today, not just with our own eyes, but by, by visiting other centuries and then learning to see the church in our own time in a different light. And that will help us, A, to be strengthened by the story of the church, to be encouraged by men and women God has wonderfully used, and it should also prevent us from making the same mistakes over and over again. Now, naturally, you didn't cover the 21st century in this book, uh, but just as a final question, and I know you're not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but how do you think church historians and others might, what they might say when they reflect back on the 21st century? I, th you know, I, I think that historians may reflect on the 21st century as a century perhaps of even greater persecution. Certainly all the signs, even in the West, is that the church will be persecuted in new ways, subtle ways, but also, you know, very painful and very serious ways. And that will show up the character of our discipleship. We have such a tendency, I think, to be Christians in the world and look at what the world is doing to the church as though that were something strange. And when we do that, we simply get discouraged. And we need to remember Peter's word, there is nothing strange about this at all. And when we begin to understand that if the world treats the church kindly, that's the thing that's really strange then I think we'll get a, not only get a better handle on preparing ourselves and our children for the future, but we'll understand that the gospel works under any and every circumstance. And that's one of the great lessons of the history of the church. There is no time, no place, no community, no race, no disability, 
no persecution, that is capable of destroying the church, and the Christian gospel works absolutely everywhere. And until we realize that, we will always be prone to the thought, only if the world is for us will we be able to make progress as a church. Well, thank you for writing in the year of our Lord. Would you join me in thanking uh, Dr. Ferguson?